All right, so we're gonna move on with our next talk, um, which is from uh, Chisha Tong. And uh, Tong joined the faculty at UCSF in 2002 as an assistant professor of pathology in the Diabetes Center, where she researched mechanisms of immune tolerance. Um, she then joined the transplantation division in the Department of Surgery to lead basic and translational research in transplant immunology. And she's been the director of the UCSF Transplantation Research Lab since 2007. Um, a major focus in her lab is on regulatory T-cell therapy for autoimmune diseases and transplantation. Um, and since 2011, she's been co-directing the regulatory T-cell therapy program at UCSF. So welcome, Tong. Thank you so much, Stacey. And thank you, Carl, for that very inspiring talk and, and for inspiring the entire field of immune cell therapy. And then thank you, Stacy and, and Alex. I don't know who did this, but put me after uh, Carl's talk and it's just an uh, impossible act to follow, but I will give it a try. Um, as, as Carl mentioned, and there have been interest of cell therapy, immune cell therapy beyond cancer. And um, one of the area of interest is to use regulatory T cell therapy. Unlike uh, other T cells, regulatory T cells, their, uh, their chief, mode of action is suppress immune response. So we can potentially use it to suppress unwanted immune response, such as autoimmune diseases and the transplantation rejection. And um, so my talk, my, my career has been focused on um, studying regulatory T cells and then apply them therapeutically. So today I'd like to share with you some of our experiences in translating TREC therapy to the clinic for transplantation tolerance. So T-REC therapy has trailed behind the cancer uh, cell therapy by um, about 20 years. The very first clinical trial or, or case report really was in 2009 in, uh, out of uh, Poland, it was a two case of patients with chronic and then acute GVHD that were treated with autologous t -rex. Ever since then, uh, there've been a lot of interest in developing the therapy. And then so far there are about say 50 uh, or so trials of uh, T-Rex cell therapy and autoimmune diseases and, and transplantation um, all over the world, mostly uh, centered in, in Europe and in, in the US. As you can see here, UCSF has a large T-Rex cell therapy program. We have conducted more than 10 clinical trials. And um, so this is our UCSF uh, T-REC therapy portfolio. We started manufacturing our first cellular product in 2011. And so in the last uh, 10 years or so, we have conducted, um, um, I think listed here is 11 trials. And in autoimmune diseases, type one diabetes, lupus, pemphigus, uh, and also in transplantation, kidney, liver, and the eyelid transplantation. And then the most recent trial we launched is um, regulatory T cell therapy for COVID-19 associated ARDS. And then you will hear from Jonathan, I think next, um, our uh, trial that we planned is for gene, um, gene edited T-REC therapy. So in this talk, I will highlight two studies in transplantation. And one is the, the, what we call the DART trial is part of the large consortium of one study. And another one is UCSF led Artemis trial um, in liver transplantation. So the one study is by far the largest uh, regulatory cell therapy program in the world. It's led by Ed Geisler at um, 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 Regensburg in Germany. And it's a, a seven centered study um, with Regensburg and Berlin in, Nantes in, in France, and then, um, and then the two UK location on uh, Milan, together with two US location, the MGH and the UCSF. So the, the study, um, all the centers use a centralized single uh, trial design backbone of design, and then uh, each center manufacture their own cell types to infuse. And all centers also in, um, conducted this reference group their, uh, trial in that uh, patient were in, enrolled and follow the same protocol, but without the cell 
infusion. So this serves as a reference group for data comparison. And then each center have their own cellular product they infused. And at Regensburg, then the cell product was regulatory macrophages. Now at NUNS is this uh, tolerogenic DC. Um, the other studies, other centers were all regulatory T cells. Um, King's College in, in London and Oxford together um, produced and infused a polychronal T-Rex. And Berlin also has uh, um, a different way of producing the polychronal T-Rex uh, without cryopreservation. I want to say that Oxford or the London T-Rex are cryopreserved. MGH and then UCSF all produced alloantigen reactive T-Rex, AR T-Rex, using different methods. And then MGH used co-stimulation blockade, whereas the UCSF used stimulated B cells um, to selectively expand alloantigen reactive cells. So this study has uh, completed and then uh, it published the primary endpoint. Um, it's a safety study. So the primary endpoint is the incidence of biopsy proof acute rejection and to see if uh, infusion of regulatory T cells uh, could actually increase this rate or, or not. Um, as you can see here, this based on the intent to treat analysis and per protocol analysis, the biopsy proven acute rejection rate were similar between the cell therapy group, the purple line, and also the red line, the reference group. So there's no increase in rejection. There's also no increase in other um, adverse events, um, as you can see across the board. And um, what we are really interested also in transplantation we monitor closely is infection uh, rate because for immuno to properly immunosuppress the patient, we need to hit the Goldilocks zone for transplantation, suppress enough so they don't reject the organ, but not too much to cause um, um, increased infection. And then in, in the long run could increase malignancy as well. So you can see here actually in, the, in, in this one study, uh, the, um, collective data of all the centers so that we saw reduced rate of infection in the cell therapy group by the teal color compared to the reference group. If you zoom in, you can see that actually the reduced infection rate is mostly uh, coming from reduced herpes viral infection load in these uh, patient population. So overall, the study concluded and it's published, so you can, if you are interested in more data, is that, that the cell therapy um, in kidney transplantation is feasible and it's well tolerated. And the field are really very interested in determining whether T-Rex therapy can be effective. In animal models, this has been shown repeatedly by many, many labs, but it has not been demonstrated in, in humans. So our way to approach this efficacy question was to think what first, what organ is best to test efficacy? And different transplant organ have different immunogenicity and then different ability to induce tolerance. So I kind of in a schematic way to um, show here that the liver is the most tolerogenic organ. You can transplant the liver with less immunosuppression. You don't even have to actually match the donor and the recipient. Whereas on the extreme end of the spectrum is bone marrow transplantation. And um, um, you need to have this high level of matching to avoid um, GVHD and graft loss. So in mouse models, liver transplantation, allergenic liver transplantation, it's spontaneously tolerated. And, um, they induce a immunotolerant um, state so that you can put other organs from the donor strain and it will be accepted. So we analyzed these uh, naive animal and compared to a mouse with a allogenic liver and then um, compared their alloimmune response toward the donor. And then here is a dilution assay. Um, looking at CD8 response to the donor antigen, to allergenic antigen and CD4 response. As you can see, all animals, all individuals have alloimmune response in the naive state. Whereas 
if the mouse harbors allogeneic liver, if you stimulate with that donor antigen, um, you will see that there's greatly diminished CD8 response. It seems to be a deletional mechanism. We have demonstrated later on by adoptive transfer that the CD8, donor-specific CD8 cells are deleted by the liver, whereas donor-specific CD4 cells are not. And But if you gate on these cells, you see a large proportion of them are regulatory T cells. Whereas in the naive animal, this is much lower percentage. If you put a skin on this mouse from the same donor, and then skin is not rejected. If you look underneath the skin after a few weeks of engraftment, you will see that underneath the skin, there are CD4 cell infiltrate and it's heavily dominated by FOXP3 positive Tregs. So we believe that Fox Tregs is actually an important mechanism for this spontaneous tolerance, but this doesn't happen in humans. So we thought perhaps in the liver setting, that we could infuse regulatory T cells just to push them over the edge to help patient achieve uh, transplantation tolerance. And then another piece of background in, in patient is that I said um, that in patients, liver transplantation is not spontaneously tolerated, whereas over time, patient can achieve a tolerant state. You can reveal this tolerant state by uh, medically supervised immunosuppression withdrawal. This is shown here by this uh, summary data of the immunosuppression withdrawal in patients. As you can see, you, as you gradually reduce immunosuppression shown by the x-axis, the rejection-free survival actually um, was pretty uh, stable until 50% uh, reduction of the drug dose. So most patients can tolerate some drug reduction and then they start to experience rejection. Ultimately, if you do this in, within the first six year after transplant, about 15% uh, um, of a patient can come off immunosuppression completely um, and then and stay off immunosuppression for more than a year. Therefore, they're truly um, tolerant to the graft. Whereas the majority of these patients experience rejection, this form of rejection is readily treatable and you can escalate the immunosuppression and then the rejection is treated, the liver enzyme return back to normal. There's no long-term consequence um, to the graft or to the patient with this short-term escalation of immunosuppression. So based on this background, we designed this trial called ARTEMIS, which stands for alloantigen reactive Tregs to enable minimization of immunosuppression. So we enrolled adult liver transplant patients. They all have living donors, selected to have living donor because we need the donor material to manufacture the alloantigen reactive Tregs. There are two to six years after liver transplantation. We aim to enroll nine to 11 patients. This is because we perform the power calculation that we need about nine, nine to 11 patients to show if we can change this curve. Um, <clears throat> so the target dose we define is 400 million plus 100 uh, million. So, so 300 to 500 million is our target dose. If patient receive this target dose, they're permitted to undergo 100% immunosuppression withdrawal. We also define a minimal infusible dose of 100 million. If uh, we, a patient received um, this 100 million to 300 million dose, then they are allowed to go to 75% immunosuppression withdrawal, but will have to be maintained um, at that level. The trial enrolled patients um, at UCSF Mayo Clinic in the Northwestern. And another decision we need to make is when to infuse the regulatory T cells. We decided to infuse the Tregs right before the 50% um, reduction of immunosuppression so that um, the Tregs are still high, highly activated, and then um, they um, are positioned right before the patient begin to experience rejection. And so this slide summarizes our uh, manufacturing scheme. Uh, we start with a peripheral blood. This can be a whole blood collection or leukophoresis. And then we fax purify Tregs based on CD4, CD25, and CD127. We take these highly purified Tregs mixed with activated donor B cells. 
This is alloantigen stimulation. And then cell proliferate extensively um, in this uh, uh, mixture. In about 11 days, all the cells remain in the culture, proliferate in the culture are donor reactive. So then we give uh, the cells another round of stimulation with anti-CD328 coded beads to polychrono expand these, uh, these cells for another five days. At the end of the culture, we then have a, um, a donor reactive, donor alloantigen reactive TREG that are actually polychronal. They use very many different receptors, but all reactive to the donor antigen. So here is, we have completed the study. And then here is the, the outcome of Artemis uh, data. It's not published and we're writing the manuscript right now. In total, about 322 um, patients were, um, medical record were reviewed. And then 59 were found eligible for the trial criteria. And, um, and then the, these um, people were actually, some of were uh, excluded because of non-medical reasons. And then um, and 25 then were able to um, be approached for consent and 10 declined, 15 consented. And additional uh, medical examination excluded five patients and we end up having 10 patients started immunosuppression withdrawal. One patient rejected um, in step one of immunosuppression withdrawal. So they um, were not eligible for ART reg manufacturing and infusion. Nine patients proceeded with ART reg manufacturing but much to our surprise, and four of them, we were not able to manufacture the drug to the minimal infusible dose of 100 million. So they dropped out of the trial. In the end, we infused five patients in this study. And then here's the summary of the five patients we infused. And then this is a dose re they received. Two of them received the target dose of above 300 million, and three of them received the partial dose. And during the manufacturing, we fed the culture with deuterated glucose. This, the deuterium then it's a stable isotope, it's incorporated into the DNA. This allows us to track these autologous cells after infusion using deuterium as a marker. And then this shows the, the, um, the number of Tregs or the level of the Tregs based on the deuterium enrichment readout after infusion. And then um, here are the individual subjects and then those of the Treg they infused. As you can see, that there's a, a quite um, a straight correlation of the dose of the Treg infused and versus the, 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 the peak of the deuterium, the, high, the, the level of the deuterium detected. We calculate the area under the curve in the first three months for these patients. And then you see this straight correlation of the dose infused and versus the deuterium area under the curve. This shows that, uh, to us that uh, the level of the Treg we infused really did not hit the ceiling of engraftment and were really um, likely underdosed. So this unexpected problem of uh, cell manufacturing really puzzled us. Um, so at the same time of manufacturing Tregs, AR Tregs, for Artemis, we also manufacture Tregs for other studies. And then when we put the data together side by side, this is the day 16 manufacturing Treg cell yield. So you can see Artemis' uh, Treg cell yield was significantly lower than that of non-Artemis subjects. And then further analysis showed that this part of the reason is because Artemis patients have less Treg uh, in their circulation. Um, therefore, we got less Tregs on day zero of the manufacturing. The less Treg we have input, the less output we have at the day 16. But that's not the entire story, right? Some of the um, patients have reasonable high uh, day zero Treg input, but still did not achieve the level of expansion we needed. And then this is because the cells, um, not, only, not only we have a lower number of cells, and they also don't expand so well. Um, this is, oops, sorry, the fold expansion um, over time, over the 16 uh, day period. You can see this is a, a very uh, 
strong correlation of the fold expansion versus day 16. So this um, sluggish expansion is also a big problem uh, with um, manufacturing the cells for Artemis. So we profiled T-Rex um, in Artemis patients and compared to other controls to see what's wrong with the T-Rex. Why don't they expand? So we developed this uh, 30 color spectral um, flow panel to profile activation markers, exhaustion markers, and then uh, transcription factors um, expressed on T-Rex. This is all gated on CD4 positive, FOXB3 positive, Helios positive T-Rex. And then the data is presented in this new map format of individual color expression. What was really interesting to me, uh, to us, is when we looked at the data, is the T-Rex don't always get activated the same way. Um, for example, CD38, CD39, and the CXCR3 are all considered activation markers, but they really um, are expressed on distinct subsets of T-Rex. And there are some overlap, like I call this activation markers, on um, both CD38 and CD39 populations. Um, and then there are um, PD-1 exhaustion marker, PD-1, KRG-1, TIM-3, for example, are uh, mostly um, co-expressed with CD38. Um, this is a, the consolidated data of all the subjects we analyzed. If you separate out um, the, this is all the subjects. And if you separate Artemis in orange versus post-kidney transplant subjects in purple versus control non-transplant, non-immunosuppressed subject, um, you can see they uh, have some differences, particularly Artemis have this very high CD38 positive population that's nearly absent in the other two uh, patient populations. And also, Artemis have a subset of these CD39 high cells um, that's um, low in other subjects. So we wondered if this is a, these kind of activation markers um, somehow correlated with the reduced expansion. So we analyzed the individual markers, um, individual, uh, the correlated individual markers uh, shown here to that of a, a T-Rex expansion during manufacturing. And then these are um, the, the, the few markers that had a significant, sig significant correlation. The HLA-DR, the higher percentage of HLA-DR, higher percentage of KRG1 or PD-1 is correlated with reduced T-Rex expansion. And then there's only one marker that's inversely correlated with the um, expansion, which is TCF1. Uh, the transcription factor that's expressed on the stem-like T cells um, in cancer T cell therapy. So based on this, we think that the Artemis patients may have, their T-Rex may have had antigen experience made them more difficult to expand. So a liver, as I mentioned, it's a most tolerant genetic tissue. It's in graduate school immunology, we heard that liver is a graveyard of T cells and T cells go to liver to die. Actually liver can actively induce T cell death and cause a deletional, peripheral deletional tolerance. And then we have also seen the Treg um, responding to liver antigen by proliferating in animal models. So this is quite different um, in that if, uh, if in patients, and we actually see a reduction of a donor reactive T-Rex. So we then um, secured another collection of samples. And because Artemis was enrolled at two to six years after liver transplantation, we don't have pre-transplant samples. So we um, received another collection of samples that's serially, collect, uh, serially collected from pre-transplant to six months and two years after transplantation so that we would be able to track donor reactive T-Rex, anti-conventional cells and CD8s, um, their dynamics after liver transplantation. This is using a dye dilution assay. As you can see clearly with donor stimulation, uh, pre-transplantation patients have donor reactive T-Rex, and then this is greatly reduced after liver transplantation. And 
if you stimulate the cells with what we call the pan alloy, it's a mixture of six different alloy antigens, and then uh, we don't see this reduction. And demonstrating that this is really select donor selective um, loss of uh, reactive cells. And then here's a summarized data of all the subjects we have analyzed. As you can see uh, that as, uh, as time progress and this uh, loss of donor reactivity is becoming more um, clear cut and more severe. And then this is not the case, not due to immunosuppression of general loss of the regulatory T cells because pan alloy reactive reactivity is um, retained. So what to go from here? Um, if we enroll patients at this late time point, they may have lost their donor reactive T cells and making it impossible to assess to, um, the e efficacy of, um, of t right therapy. And we therefore designed another uh, study we call LITMUS. And this study, we have moved everything up to close to the time of transplantation before this dysfunctional loss, deletion, we don't know what it, yet it, uh, what it is yet. But if we move it earlier uh, before the dysfunction is locked in, and then we can, um, we, we hope we can, we'll be able to manufacture the T-Rex for these patients. We also added the lymphodepletion step. So this will help the T-Rex um, even at the lower dose uh, we infuse, so we'll be able to uh, control the residual response and you don't have to um, control um, the, the unperturbed um, immune response to, to the allo antigens. And then so in the litmus trial, we, um, we will manufacture cells and then give a lymphodepletion and then infuse the Tregs and then withdraw immunosuppression and, and then, then assess tolerant state um, afterwards. So this trial has just transplanted the first patients and we haven't infused the patient yet. And so I hope to be able to report um, the outcome of this trial um, in, in the next few years. So another solution um, is, as we have heard in, in the talks in the morning is the engineer cells to, the, um, to donor antigens. And in transplantation, we know the mismatched HLAs. So this will give us a on-graft uh, target that, that's not expressed in the patient. And then um, indeed, people have been using CAR to engineer Tregs ever since 2005. In 2016 and 17, there were three independent groups and developed anti-HLA CARs and then used them to uh, test um, transplantation um, in, in animal preclinical models, and some of them are progressing to clinical trials. And there has always also been comparison um, of intracellular domains of CD28, um, intracellular domain versus 1BB, and then so far the consensus is CD28 is by far um, much better than 4BB in very many different labs and reported, well, three different labs reported this kind of outcome. Um, so here we have also generated anti-HLA A2 car um, that we built this car and then targeted into the track locus using Alex Marson's protocol. And then as you can see, we can ch achieve a, a quite robust way of uh, converting the cells into a car positive negative cells and after editing. And then they're highly response, uh, responsive to anti-HLA stimulation measured by CD71 upregulation. And um, the traffic to the site of the transplant, this is using islet transplantation that's placed on, to, on the right kidney. So you can see um, shortly after infusion of these CAR Tregs, they mostly are found in the spleen to the left side of the animal. And as time progressed, the cell moved into the graft to the right side of the animal. So they accumulate in the, um, in the graft site, um, unlike the polyclonal t rex And in the GVHD model, we also show that these CAR t rex are potent in this very, very lethal model of GVHD, xenogen GVHD we used. So synthetic biology may help us to overcome the the dysfunction of regulatory T cells we have uh, seen in liver transplant patients. So let me just summarize. Um, so far, 
regulatory T cells have been um, had 12 years of uh, clinical development, and there are more than 15 trials. More than 100 patients have been infused. Up to a 7 billion T Rex have been infused uh, per dose into patients. It has been shown to be well tolerated. And it's also feasible to manufacture billions of regulatory T cells for um, autologous use. And then in some of the studies, and then some favorable changes of immunological markers have been observed, but overall efficacy has not been demonstrated. In the future, we need more robust cell manufacturing technologies. We need a strategy to manufacture antigen-specific cells. I talked about our difficulty in manuf manufacturing alloantigen reactive cells, but when we consider autoantigen reactive cells, such as iodine antigen, and then they are extremely rare. It's nearly impossible to selectively expand them out of the peripheral blood. So we need to have um, other approaches such as synthetic biology to help us to target the T-Rex to the autoimmune tissue. And then efficacy of the trial uh, of T-Rex therapy has not been seen. And then in general, um, people in the fields are discussing what disease should we best target and then what antigen should we target the T-Rex to and what cell dose. None of these has been defined, but there's intense interest and in lots of activities and hoping in the next five years, we will start to be able to address some of these questions in patients. And then lastly, um, it's, I think nearly, um, sorry, um, unlikely that T-Rex by itself can work because in the autoimmune settings, I'm sorry that my computer wants to move forward, um, that, that they have failed, T-Rex have failed. So some either synthetic fix or some friendly adjunct therapies will be needed to help these T-Rex to succeed. And then we don't know what these adjunct therapy or synthetic fix are. So that's uh, lots of work to be done. And um, I want to just finish by acknowledging the extensive network of people to make this possible. And then first of all, as a bench scientist, a PhD scientist, it's extremely rewarding and inspiring to be able to um, be part of this uh, patient facing studies. And so um, I have the for uh, I've been fortunate to, to see some of these patients treated and then their interest in the science is really uh, inspirational. And then this program is co-led by Jeff Bluestone uh, before he retired and started Sonoma Biotherapeutics uh, and also Jonathan Essesman, you'll you hear next. And then um, we have uh, a large program um, of people uh, that made the cell therapy, manufactured cells and made the cell therapy possible. And uh, I have a large group of collaborators in, at UCSF Transplantation and, and beyond. And then particularly the ARTMIS study is designed by Sandy Fain and then Josh and Tumuchin at uh, Northwestern and the Mayo Clinic um, uh, are um, also active participants of the ARTMIS study. And then my lab um, are now uh, engineering um, regulatory T cells with desired features. And then, so this is my lab from pre-pandemic several years ago. And then we also have a small group of people uh, we call it human immunology to analyze patient samples, to learn from patients and so that we can design better therapies. Particularly, I want to highlight Joey, um, who's here, who have conducted all the mechanistic study I showed you. Thank you so much for your attention.